Um, hello, everyone. My name is Lizbeth Murillo. As Jenny introduced me, I'm mapping potential areas for dengue outbreaks in the Hawaiian Islands. So just a quick background on, on what the dengue fever virus is. It is a mosquito-borne illness, specifically from the Aedes albopictus species. It spreads rather quickly because once an infected mosquito bites a person, it then transmits part of that virus into them. And as we all know, mosquitoes don't just die once they bite someone, they go around and bite multiple people, thus spreading the virus quicker. Uh, symptoms include extreme fevers, body aches, headaches, nausea, and unfortunately, it can be deadly. Um, cases have been reported in over 100 countries across the world, and yet there is still no vaccine for this virus. Some notable outbreaks I wanted to highlight, specifically the 2001 Hawaiian outbreak that reported 122 cases. This is just a quick map of the Hawaiian islands with the cities that had cases in them. And although this one was in 2001, seven years later, we still have much larger outbreaks occurring across the world. For example, the American region reported 3.1 million cases, Bangladesh had 101,000 cases, Malaysia had 131,000 cases, and then the Philippines reported 420,000 cases. So for my project, like I said, I wanted to map possible dengue outbreaks across the Hawaiian islands, but I adopted this approach from a 2006 paper where they listed general requirements for mosquito survival habitats. And I wanted to get those general requirements and then build a model with where I those requirements and then it would give me a layout of where these possible dengue outbreaks would occur. They focused on the 2001-2002 outbreak with data specific to that, but for my project, I'm using data on a 30-year average span. I broke down my data into three different components. I have my climate, I have water sources, and I have people. For climate, I used average annual precipitation, I used average June precipitation, and I used average February minimum temperatures. I looked at precipitation data, not only because the paper listed it as a general requirement, but because um, mosquitoes aren't necessarily attracted to the rainfall, but it's what the rainfall leaves behind. And it's these small stagnant pools of water that make up for perfect breeding grounds for mosquitoes. I included June precipitation because that is the driest month of the season for the Hawaiian islands. So I wanted to make sure that even during this month where they're not receiving a lot of precipitation, there are still some areas that can house specific um, mosquito habitats with just enough rainfall. And then I also included the temperatures for February because that is the coldest month throughout the season in Hawaii. And mosquitoes tend to thrive in warmer, wetter conditions. So even though there's precipitation, it still needs to be warm enough for this mosquito to survive in. I also looked at water sources like wetlands and streams, just in case for just to add to the wet component of that environment. And then, of course, we need people because without people, there is not an outbreak. So I looked at the populated areas across the islands. And again, this is my area of study, the Hawaiian Islands. So my first data set is the average annual precipitation. Here, all the areas in green meet that threshold of at least 500 millimeter pre precipitation a year. I use the reclassification tool in ArcGIS to differentiate between areas that were suitable for mosquito habitats and areas that are not of importance because they don't meet the, just the minimum of the 500 millimeters precipitation throughout the year. Then looking at the minimum June precipitation data, all the areas in green are areas that get at least 40 millimeters of precipitation in June, and that's enough to house mosquitoes. And all the areas in gray are ones where mosquitoes would essentially not survive because they don't meet the precipitation requirement. And then this is my February data, which is the coldest month. And these are the areas in green are areas that would barely meet the warmer condition aspect of the environment for a mosquito. All the areas in gray, essentially mosquitoes would not survive in because they're not warm enough. And the threshold for that was 10 degrees Celsius and above. Now, what I did is all the maps on the left-hand side are the maps I previously showed you of the data sets. And I combined all three raster data sets 
making my final data or climate data map, which has all three components met. So all of the areas in green are where the data, the three data sets are overlaid. Areas that had one or two were not included because again, we need those three general requirements to be met in order for mosquitoes to survive. Then when I went ahead and looked at the wetlands and streams data, I did download the data sets individually and then I combined them. I also added a 50 meter buffer because mosquitoes are known to fly up to 50 meters from their original water source. So I wanted to take into account that traveling distance. So here we have wetlands and streams with the 50 meter buffer added. And then I combine my wetlands and streams buffer data with the minimum temperature of February data, which is the maps on the left-hand side. And then the larger map is the areas that have both. So I use the cell statistics tool to include, include areas that have wetlands and streams, but also are warm enough for mosquito survival. Because even if it's barely warm enough, they might not have a water source and therefore may not survive. So I want areas that have the water source and also provide the warmer climate for them. Once I combine all of my final data sets, the climate data, which had all three rasters and then the wetlands and streams data with the February minimum temperatures, I, I built basically this ideal habitat for mosquitoes to survive. And across the Hawaiian Islands, here we have all the areas in yellow that are suitable for mosquito survival. And then bringing people into the picture, this is just a quick reference as to the populated places across the islands of where people are located. And what I did is I intersected this data set with my ideal habitat data set to further look at areas where dengue outbreaks would occur in respect to where people are located. And as a result, I get this final data set, which maps out the at-risk areas for dengue outbreaks in respect to where people are located. On the right-hand side, I have a table of the 22 cities that all reported cases in the 2001 outbreak. And as a quick reference, we can see that of the 22 cities that reported cases, 19 fall within my at-risk areas. And so taking a closer look at that, I'm doing a quick fly over the Hawaiian Islands and I overlaid my at-risk zones for the dengue outbreaks. And all the areas in red is that layer that I showed previously that are the at-risk areas that my steps resulted in. And here the big island, although there's not many of those at-risk areas, it's still covering those cities that reported cases. So here we see Oahu, it's got more at-risk areas. And then we're gonna take a look at three of the cities that fell outside of my at-risk areas, but still reported cases in the outbreak. And it's not to say that the model or my final data set was faulty or faulty because this city falls right in between two at-risk areas. So one can say it sells away. It's not necessarily that it wasn't accurate. It's still fairly close. And this city is also not as close, but still close to the at-risk areas. And then the third city that reported having cases, but wasn't included in the at-risk zones, that one's pretty far away from the other ones. And overall, the model did report some high accuracy going forward. Okay, so this is a quick layout of the model that I built. As you can see, it's fairly large and it's got multiple steps in it. Um, when I was doing my project, I did go in and do each step at a time prior to building the model. And what I found out that was with all these steps, it's really easy to make a mistake and it's a lot more difficult to catch it until you're further down the line. And then you have to go back and retrace your steps and see exactly where you made your mistake and how it impacted all the other steps that came after that. So having this model is a lot easier to deal with because it's an automated process. All you need is the accurate data for your specific zone 
And once you input that, the model will do the rest for you. And in case if there is a mistake, it'll pinpoint where your mistake was made and how you can go back and fix it specifically. Just you can see the steps at a time. So if you have a mistake halfway through the middle, then the model will point that out. And from that, you'll just go, you'll fix it and then be able to go forward. So in conclusion, I did want to say that for being a general model, it did fairly well because again, it had 19 of those 22 cities in the 2001 outbreak. And with this model, current and future mosquito prevalence cities can use it to just to identify cities that are parts of their cities that are most likely to have a dengue outbreak. So cities that have an above average rainfall season can go ahead and just put the data necessary and then pinpoint locations where they might be at risk. Also, it can be used for cities that aren't impacted every year, but impacted by cycles like El Nino that bring the warmer and wetter conditions necessarily and only happen two to seven years. They can use this model to again, pinpoint areas that need attention to after these specific cycles. Public officials can also use this model to locate areas that are still developing but need attention in terms of outbreaks or how they can prevent outbreaks and also educate the general public. So mosquito habitats and what meet the perfect conditions to house mosquitoes, they can list the, those conditions to the public and see if they live near cities with waters and streams or stagnant waters or how to even prevent being bitten by mosquitoes as well. Um, the model doesn't just stop there. It's not to say that it's limited to the dengue fever virus. It can also be used for other mosquito-borne illnesses, for example, Zika or malaria, where requirements may differ just by a bit, but because it's a general model, you can get the necessary data for your specific virus and input that into the model. And then that'll automate the process and highlight areas that are at risk as well. So again, thank you. Do you guys have any questions? Please let me know.